don't even imagine that you're going to memorize very much of this at all because this is just like an incredible amount of information you'll never your brain won't hold all this information but that's not what we're doing right now what we're doing right now is we're familiarizing ourselves right man you know i taught you guys the educational psychology right and that is that your brain makes something called a schema and the schema is what holds information right and so when you first start learning something for the first time it's always the hardest right the first time you learn something is always the hardest and then what happens is as your brain creates the categories for it then it becomes easier and easier and easier to learn okay so we're still kind of in the beginning phase of this we did nasa system engineering which you guys know we did cube satellite um basically the size shape the burnout you guys i think pretty much have mastered that but what we haven't looked at is the specific components all the different components that go into it so that's what we're going to look at today so we're basically looking at systems and subsystems Okay, so, so don't put a lot of pressure on yourself to, to try to memorize this stuff. We're just trying to, that's not our goal. Our goal is just to familiarize ourselves, okay? Can I blabber on about that more? Y'all get it, right? Y'all get it. Does everyone get it? Yeah. Everyone yes. gets it. All right, so here we go. Okay, so what we see here, state of the art. So the first thing that we got to do is we got to familiar familiarize ourselves with this term it's called trl trl means technology readiness level okay so a trl of one means that you only have the idea a trl of five that's in the middle that means that you kind of tested it and when you tested it it basically worked the technology readiness level five means yeah we think this thing works okay technology level seven is that we we kind of tested a prototype in space technology rating this level nine TR, trl nine means this thing has flown in space and we know it works right i mean this thing works in space okay and so if you if you use technology that's trl nine then you know there's a high probability that it's going to work in space and you're not going to have any um, issues with it all right so that's what we call the trl readiness level okay one of the things that we want to do is we want to focus on our mission and our payload and we don't want to focus we re reinvent the wheel on all the other subsystems we just want to use stuff that's proven right we we talked about that when we did um nasa system engineer we know actually like every lecture that point has been in there right to not reinvent the wheel but use stuff that's um, already proven okay um, so we've got a lot to look at here if we don't finish today that's fine we don't have to finish today okay I think we're gonna go fast but if we don't finish today that's fine okay there's a space class um, there's the platform complete space platform there's the power this propulsion guidance nav control um, structure material mechanisms that's the, that's like the physical body of it thermal control command and handling comms integration launch and deployment I cut that we're not gonna worry about that ground, then ground system um, passive the orbit I cut that too I mean if the thing's gonna crash into the earth I mean <laughs> who cares if it floats around up there for an extra year okay all right, so um, what is a, a spa spacecraft platform? All right, so basically this is, um, uh, the bus is provided, you see modular platforms upon which a payload can be hosted and ready to fly. So you, you're almost purchasing, in a sense you're kind of purchasing a, a kit that's gonna host your payload. And your, what is your payload? Well, your payload's your experiment. And that's, that's your payload. It's your mission. It's the thing that you're trying to accomplish. So you don't want to reinvent from scratch a whole CubeSat if you if you want to um, uh, get a a platform. Okay. So you can see there's a lot of companies here that do it. Um, 
right? You guys see the um, AAC has a 1U CubeSat, uh, complete CubeSat kits, right? And these, and you can see that almost all of these are TRL9. So the, these companies basically have supplied CubeSats to people that want to fly payloads, and they've done so successfully. TRL9 means it survived in space, but it survived basically for the duration of its mission. It then, it wasn't, it wasn't cut short. Okay, so here's one on um, high performance nano satellite platform from 1U to 12U, payload volumes, 0.2U um, to 8U, okay? And um, so now we're kind of assuming that we're looking at a 1U, right? One unit, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters is what we're looking at, right? We're, we're, we're making that. Uh, Maybe to you if somebody comes up with a really cool mission. No, okay. it's 10 by 10 by 11. 10 by 10. He's right. 10 by 10 by 11. Who knew new studies? All right. So you can see, like, you, you basically stick your payload in the hole over here, and they shoot it into space. GOM space. I love GOM space. Look at that. Is that a 2U or a 3U? That's looking... That's looking 2.5 U to me, you know. So you buy the whole thing. Look, they got the antennas flying out here. You got your your payload. They got this in here. You stick your payload experiment over here. Maybe this is like a camera. All right. UHF, VHF radio. 1U, 2U, 3U variants. You're buying the kit. You're sticking your payload in there. Brilliant. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Oh, pumpkin. Chris, I can't say enough about pumpkin. You can't say enough about pumpkin. You like pumpkins? I like pumpkins. People love pumpkin. Okay? Pumpkins and I don't, are amazing. Huh? Pumpkins are great. Pumpkins are great. You know? I think we, we could start... I, I like jack-o'-lanterns. But we like pumpkins. Since 2000, pumpkin... Like, I want to meet these engineers. Like... You probably could, I mean, if we just make a few calls. I just want to ask him, like, who came up with the name Pumpkin? Okay, I just want to just want to know. Flying laptop? Okay, so you got a, pre, a, 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 a complete pre-config small price craft 3U there in that, on that air. Okay, so there's your 3U. You stick your payload in. You're good to go right? The whole thing is made for you. Um, Pico satellites are kind of funny. And again, it, it depends on what mission statement that we end up with. Maybe one of you will come up with an idea that really doesn't need much space at all. And if so, there's the Pico satellite, half the size of a 1U cat, uh, satellite. And um, then, of course, the benefit is with a Pico is that it's so light that it's super cheap to get into um, space, pocket cube, right? And so he says it's one eighth of the cost, around 20 grand of a CubeSat, which is a CubeSat's like, <clears throat> CubeSat, CubeSats are expensive, so a PicoSat's a lot less expensive. All right, so let's talk about power systems. So maybe we can get down a couple of these acronyms. Electrical power system, EPS is the power generator storage distribution. Okay, well, let's talk about the distribution then. Okay, the distribution was called PMAD, Power Management and Distribution. All right, so EPS is kind of a broader term. PMAD is kind of a smaller term. PMAD talks about how that energy is distributed, which is really, really important. And most of the time, most of the energy is conserved for the payload because that's the mission. That's the whole point of the thing. But obviously, you need some energy um, um, reserve for, you know, just to run the operations of the whatever other components are necessary, like storage and things like that. Um, so what are some ways to get power? 
One is solar cells. 85% of all nanosatellites use solar cells with rechargeable batteries. The limitation is the fact that they, um, limitation to solar cells is they degrade over the mission. Uh, they, you need a high surface area. And you can see also the solar cell efficiency is really low. I mean, 30% efficiency is considered high. So, you know, you can't, I mean, NASA uses like 90, 98% efficiency. They use super, super expensive solar cells. Most solar cells really aren't that efficient and they wear out in space. I added this here, photovoltaic cells or solar cells are made from thin mints. I added that. Did you see that? The mints? That was mine. Okay. <clears throat> so here's um, some solar cell companies. AAC Clyde. I love them. TRL 9s. Solar panel nanocubes. I, I, I often couldn't get the whole thing in there. There's Obviously, there's a lot. GOM space. I mean, probably Pumpkin. They all have, you know, buying solar cells. Uh, are real easy. Now, don't forget there's what we call COTS, C-O-T-S, consumer, no, not consumer, commercial off the shelf. These are the cheap, the cheap ones that you, you, just, you can buy in a store or buy on Amazon from anybody. And, and sometimes COTS is risky, but sometimes, sometimes COTS can save you a lot of money, but sometimes COTS is risky because it's, it doesn't necessarily have a high TRL number maybe has it been used successfully in space so you got to be you got to watch it now some cost products have been successfully used in space and so you can save a lot of money that way but you want to make sure they've been successfully used in space right like last time we talked about somebody who sent up a really really expensive cube satellite but one of the parts was like a 26 dollars that he had bought somewhere else and it and it just it trashed the whole thing because of one cheap part right Okay, um, so Nano Avionics has some really fancy looking solar cells there. 28% efficiency, providing some nice wattage there, looking good. Custom, one, one U2, U3, custom size. Innovative Solutions also has solar panels. I love them. Endurosat, look, at they've got the fancy blue ones. Very attractive, 30% solar cells. Really, really thin. Um, one U size, 1.5 U size. You know, I like these guys because like that that metal blue is, looks so cool. I love that. How expensive are they? We're not going to worry about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All of this stuff is frighteningly expensive. We're not going to worry about that, right? Because what we're for sell. Yeah, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna um we're gonna we're gonna go to the to the used the used CubeSat store where they sell used CubeSats. We're gonna we're gonna. You mean I, the ones that crashed? Yeah, you hear ones that burned through the atmosphere. The ones that blew up. <laughs> yeah. They sell ash. Yeah, you know when you buy a CubeSat, you know the the value goes down so quickly. You know we could get a good deal. Maybe we'll lease one. We could lease a CubeSat, save a lot of money that way. Who needs to buy a solar panel when you can have solar panel ash? Yeah. Yeah, because then you know, you know, this solar panel, like, it's been there. It worked. Power storage. Um, solar energy. Okay, and, and primary, sec okay, you have, pri now, th this is something to learn, primary and secondary batteries. Primary batteries don't recharge. They're basically there just to get the thing started. Okay. Um, you know, and so probably your startup, all your startup functions is going to be the primary battery. When primary battery dies, it's done. Okay. They're only used for around one day up to one week. Um, and it gives you some stats there. Secondary battery. This is where we get into nickel cadmium, lithium ion. Okay, these are your rechargeable batteries, right? 
And so if you're going the whole, well, really any route, but obviously if you're going the solar panel route, you need the rechargeable batteries. You guys know how this works already, right? You're going around the earth once every 90 minutes in low earth orbit. So for 45 minutes, your solar panels are charging the battery. And then for 40, the other 45 minutes, the battery is running the, running the machinery in the dark because there's no longer an energy supply, right? So you, you can't have, you can't have solar powers without rechargeable battery, right? Because you need something to run it for that 45 minutes in the dark. So we want to have as few power consuming components as possible or having it be yeah, yeah, as yeah. power efficient as possible. Sure. Right. And so that's, that's one of the give or take things, right? Is that the less you have going on, the less energy you need. Right. And, so any way that you can save energy is good. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so, you know, we mentioned this uh, earlier this week. There's this idea that, well, if you have deployable solar panels, instead of just one stuck on the side, if you have deployable solar panels and if you have attitude control, you can always keep them facing towards the sun. You're going to get a whole lot more energy. But then you're adding all these components and subsystems that you didn't need before to do that. And the more complicated you get, the more of a chance you might run into trouble, right? So that, that's one of the give or take things that has to be considered, okay? Um, you know, but again, I don't think we should worry about those details until we have a mission. And then when we have a mission, then we work backwards and say, what does this mission require? Okay. So all this stuff that we're looking at, some of it we don't even, we may, we might not even need. We, we still need to familiarize ourselves with this stuff. Okay. All right. So, um, so this is the secondary battery, lithium ion, of course, you've heard of because it's in all your laptops. And you can see with this is, this is little chart shows how much energy you get per volume. Okay. Um, battery cell energy density, the Panasonic here looks really, really nice. Okay. So you want a high energy density because it means you're getting more power, less space because with a cube satellite space is always, you know, a, an issue, right? Okay. And then here's all these companies that make um, batteries. You can see, all these ones that are TRL-9 have been used successfully in space already, right? So if you put those into your design, then you know, okay, this and we know this, that this is gonna work, all right? Obviously, GOM space. I'm surprised that Canon did it because basically you're talking about a camera cell, right? TRL-9, it's kind of funny because, yeah. Um, so let's see what they look like, right? So um, here, these are the secondary batteries. These are the rechargeable batteries. You can see that they're made in these cool little platforms, right? That you can just stack inside your CubeSat, right? And again, you've got that very attractive metallic blue, very fancy, I like that. Um, lithium ion polymers, really, really cool. Oh, look at that, 10 to 80 watt hours, standalone batteries. Very attractive, you know. Um, Eagle picture, look, oh, these guys, great. 28.8 volts, but slightly lower TRL-7, not sure if it's worth the risk. GOM space, always coming through. One and, and two use rechargeable batteries, 20 watt hour capacity, 30 watts, eight volts, love them. Love those people. Oh, oh. This was one of my favorites, the Canon lithium ion battery. It looks like you stole it right off the camera. They probably didn't even change anything. They probably just, you know, put CubeSat on it. Because that looks like, look at that. That looks like the thing that slides onto your camera and hooks on your camera. Look at, they didn't even change anything. Okay. That uh, looks like the really old battery version, though. That's my point. But They're just a bunch it, of old camera batteries that they couldn't sell anymore. But if it works... 
then, you know, if you're sending cameras in the space, that's maybe they figured that out. Okay. Um, power management and distribution. All right. Power management and distribution. This is the whole EPS thing. So this is how we distribute it. Okay. The EPS is power generation and storage. Power management and distribution is what controls the spacecraft load, right? Load is the, is the impressive engineering word for, you know, that how you're sending the power out, right? And so here we're talking about, you know, um, basically how you're controlling the electrics, um, and and it, which which will depend on how complicated the thing is. If 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 you have to power um, a a gyroscope, if you have to power a thruster, if you have to, you know, right? It all depends on what's in the thing. Okay, if you have to power a camera, okay. So you can you can just buy these things, right? You can buy a CubeSat kit, TRL nine. It's already been used in space. EPS from AAC Clyde, TRL eight. It's a little bit risky there, but not too risky. Small satellite by AAC Clyde, you know, nine, right? Power supply here nine. So these are all things that are that you can buy. Here here's what it looks like. Okay. So here's an EPS, and you can see it has all the ports for whatever you need to plug into it. So instead of, instead of huh? VGA, this looks very VGA-ish. So I would imagine this is actually for some kind of a camera, just because it does look VGA. -ish. It looks pretty. It looks pretty old. Yeah, and then you got those USB-looking things there yeah. too, because the USB is probably faster. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh wait, hold on. I got a message here, Mr. Herman. Okay. Uh. Yeah. Right. So you you just you know you can just buy this thing, hook the battery up to it, and the computer up to it, and and it 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 does some of the regulation. So. All right. Um. Oh, pumpkin. Christian. Pumpkin, again, coming through, right? I love pumpkin, okay? Pumpkin's got a really nice looking one, okay? The electrical power system from Kumpen, efficient, high power option for nanosatellites. Um, it's 0 0.3 kilograms or less. Um, features up to three watts of power, 60 volts. You gotta be careful, because you know, 0.3, kilograms that only leaves you with 0.7 left right so i mean that's the that's the little trick here right is that you got to try to keep it less than like 1.1 1.2 kilograms okay propulsion y'all with me yep. remember we're just familiarizing yes. ourselves you're not yes. you're not asked to memorize any of this stuff you're, we're just this is just familiarization familiarization okay that's why if I'm acting silly, it's because we're just familiarizing ourselves. This is a process, right? Okay. Which is what you learn when you're a teacher, right? You learn that learning happens in stages, right? Okay. That's why you go to learning school. I went to learning school to be a teacher. Okay. So um, chemical uh, propulsion. Propulsion. Again, is it necessary? Probably not, but could be. Okay. Um, chemical propulsions are designed for thrust for maneuvers. They're in, ex associated with low specific impulse. I, I'll, I'll teach specific impulse later. Let's not worry about it now. Okay. Now we have alternative green propellants. Do you know if you, when your rocket goes into space, it, it creates more like chemical pollute? I'm, I'm shutting this thing up because I'm just done with it. Okay. It creates more pollution than like, I don't know, like a thousand cars or something ridiculous. I mean like 10,000 cars or something super ridiculous, right? So now they're actually trying to make green propellants for spacecraft. So alternative green propellants, because hydrazine is not green, okay? Green propellants have reduced toxicity due to the low danger of the component chemicals and significantly reduce vapor pressure as compared to hydrazine. Uh, 
it's less flammable, which in turn requires fewer safety requirements. All right. And the propellant is less prone to external leakage, which is also seen, which is a, makes it less hazardous. External hydrogen leakage is considered catastrophic, whereas alternative green propellants is, is considered less severe, right? So hydrogen is a, is a typical fluid used for rocket propulsion, but if it leaks, it's considered a, a catastrophic event because it's such a dangerous chemical. So green propellants are an option. All right, so and if so- If we were to use any propellants, we'd have to use green propellants because uh, we, because for testing purposes, we can't just use hydrazine willy-nilly. Yeah. Well, we have to figure out how to get a lithium ion battery to Hawaii in the first. We ain't even gonna have a battery. We have to figure out how to get a lithium ion battery to Hawaii. You know. Why don't we just illegally do it? Wait, oh. Well, that's a good point. If I when I order from Amazon from a Chinese company, it gets here through Walmart. Yeah. But if I order directly from the States, like they won't ship it. All right, so here we have some propellants. Hydrazine is a TR9. Um, the green propulsion, I don't know what that means. Hand 6, ADN 9. Um, so, anyway, so anyway, so we're just looking at some different propellants here. Electro spray propulsion. Uh, at the, the Hall effect thrusters, that really, we're not even going to worry about that because that's just nuts. Again, ion engines is another thing. I think like, uh, the different letters or perhaps the type of fuel they need, like their propellant. Oh, is that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, cold gas, I think, is just depressurized gas. Hydrogen, obviously, is a combustant. Green is oh. a combustant. Pulse plasma and vacuum arc thrusters. This is when you're actually like ionizing particles, um, similar to the Hall effect thrusters, where you're like ionizing, like you're ionizing them by stripping the electrons off, and then you create like this magnetic field, and then boom, the stuff goes flying out. Okay, this is a whole concept between ion engines, Hall effect thrusters. They all work on the, those kind of principles. Um, solar sails, I think you've heard of. That's where it just takes the pressure of the solar wind and it pushes it. And um, the Planetary Society launched one, uh, I think about a year ago, with solar sails. It was a 3U kit, and they were trying to whip it out of Earth orbit because it only went to low Earth orbit. Um, you know, not a lot of success, I don't think, but some. Uh, you really, solar sails have to be huge. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, so it, it's debatable whether or not their solar cells were successful because they, they're, they were just trying to get out of low Earth orbit, you know. Okay, enough about that. So you can see there's these different kind of thrusters. Here we talk about so we'll teach this stuff later. You don't have to worry about the details now. Okay, so here's green propulsion. All these companies make the green propulsion systems. You can see that they're very new. Look at the TRLs here, right? They're really, really new. Um, only ADN has this, this successfully one that's even used in space. Everything else is still in the in the late testing phase. Okay, here's um. Okay, these are the this is what the little thrusters look like. Okay, you can see there's a penny there, right? So they had to miniaturize all these systems to make them um, compatible for CubeSats. And that's why some of them don't work. Like the ion thruster, like you, some of this stuff is really, really hard to, to miniaturize. Um, cold gas. Thrust is produced by the expulsion of an inert, non-toxic propellant, which can be stored at high pressure or saturated liquid form, right? And when you're doing it in CubeSat, you know, you only have so many shots because if you're expending your fuel, but you're only this big to begin with, Right, and then you've got 
you have to know you have to really know what you're doing to to use um, propulsion effectively. Uh, so here's the here's some cold gas pr propulsion systems. A lot of this has been used, you know, and TR, they're all TRL nines. So, so um, why don't we just grab a fire extinguisher and put it up in space? Yes, and that's romantic too because I saw that movie. Wally. Wally. Yeah, this, that's a very romantic option. Um, so here's the cold gas system, right? I guess I don't really. See, yeah, you can see that there's a cold gas system there. Okay. Um, solid motors. Okay, so. In space parlance, the difference between a motor and an engine is a motor basically burns like a solid rocket motor, but then an engine is something that usually has liquid. Um, but there's usually at least two, at, at least two things going on with the liquid, where you have the combustible and the oxidizer. Like the new, and you guys actually know this stuff already. Like LOX is a liquid. It's a so it's for an engine. Whereas a solid rocket booster, they call that a motor. Okay, so here's solid rocket motors. Okay, where the propellant is actually a solid, and you're just burning the solid. Basically, it's a firecracker. I mean, you you know, basically, yeah, you can't really control it either. Like once it turns on, you're not turning it back on. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the whole problem with motors is once you light the thing, it's going, right? Hmm. But this guy's been effective. The the MAP. All right, electric propulsion systems. Resistive jets is the simplest form of electric propulsion. Thrust is produced by electrically heating the propellant, so the gas is expanded and shot out. So it's an electric propulsion. Okay, so it's another propulsion system that's been used successfully in space. Electrospray propulsion um, uses. Um, electrostatic extraction and acceleration of, of ions from a propellant of negligible vapor pressure. The propellant does not need to be pressurized for storage. So that, I guess that's the benefit of this is that they don't have to pressurize the, the propellant. But you're still using something basically to heat it up, um, accelerate the ions, and then the ions go flowing out, shooting out the back of it because they're probably like an the, the ions are going to be positively charged. If you have a negative charge thing, then that's going to make them fly out, and you that the pressure then pushes the spacecraft forward. Okay, don't worry. We can talk more about how this stuff works in detail later. Okay, we're just doing basics right now. So here's Wait, an electric. The ion thing worked by uh, electrically charging the uh, ion or the uh, the particles, and then shooting them out with a electric uh, with a magnet, basically. And the force from equal and opposite reaction pushes that itself. Right. So um, I could be getting these mixed up because there's some that are similar. But basically, you have um, the propellant, and you you have an electron gun, and the electron gun shoots the propellant, and the electrons strip the other electrons off of the propellant, so you end up with the positive ion, and then there's some kind of a magnetic field that's negatively charged and it pushes the positive ions and there's some kind of a filter i don't really know the physics of it that only lets the positive ions through but then they but then they go at high speeds and there's even a way and i don't i don't know if they do this for cubesats but there's even a way where they they reshoot the electrons back down on the ions to neutralize them as they're exiting so it doesn't do damage to the system because um, a lot of a lot of damage to CubeSats happens from you know positive ions in the upper atmosphere like like when you have that um uh, um they just call it O not O2 you know you all know O2 is oxygen right but just uh -huh. O itself huh oxygen is O2 okay but O by itself is actually really dangerous because it's highly reactive to any everything. It's in the upper atmosphere because the radiation of the upper atmosphere hits the oxygen, splits it, and so you get just O up there. Um, I'm sure there's a name for it, but it, I'm just going to call it O. Let's go with atomic oxygen, or let's call it O1 instead of O2. 
Okay. So you got a bunch of O1 floating ozone. up. Ozone. Ozone is O3, I think, right? Is it no ozone? Yeah. O3? Okay, yeah. So we're talking O1. So we got a bunch of O1 up there. And it's so highly reactive that it does incredible damage to anything up there. Right. And so that's one of the reasons why when you manufacture a cube satellite, you got to use stuff that's like really sturdy material. All right. Anyway, so just give our cube set some antioxidants. Some antioxidants would be good. Why don't yeah. we just let it blow up for the view? Oh, yeah. That's we've thought of that. We thought of that putting magnesium on it so we get like a really a little <laughs> bit of potassium too, you know. You know, hurt. I don't know if I don't know where my interest in astronomy came from, but it may have come from this event. I was like in fourth or fifth grade. I was in the car with my nanny. Nanny, that's what my Italian grandmother. Okay. I was in the car with my nanny and I saw a fireball in the middle of the day. I mean, it was like I'm talking middle of the day. I'm talking like like 1 p.m. middle of the day and it wasn't it wasn't like a little you know like like a little shooting star like it wasn't like that it was a fireball i mean it was like as big as the sun and it was like in the middle of the day i was like somebody's about to lose their house man because if that thing lands i mean it was it was big and i carried after that event i carried a camera around for me for like a year and a half you know, because like, like no one would have believed it. Anyway, so anyway, I digress. All right, y'all with me? Yeah. All right. So here we have. You can see how small this thing. This is an. This little thing is a thruster. A little electro spray thruster, and you can see here that you've got nine, um, eight of them right here on this CubeSat right here. So this must be the bottom of the satellite, and it, it's a uh, you know eight little thrusters here that, that move the thing around. It's still very weak thrusters, aren't they? There's a cute little thrusters. I love them. Okay. All right. Um, electrospray propulsion thrusters. Okay. Not a whole, not a high TRL level, so a little bit risky. Um, ion engines. I think this is what we were talking about. Propellant is ionized using plasma, uh, radio frequency, uh, refuse rough by producing ions, and then you basically your exhaust is the is the ions, the positively charged things whose atoms have been stripped, whose electrons have been stripped from them. Pulse plasma and vacuum arc thrusters. The thrust is produced by triggering a high voltage discharge between two electrodes. Like you can see this thing when you put your hands on, right? And it creates the arc, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, Kitchen electric arc that that typically ablates a solid state material like Teflon. The self-generated magnetic field is produced as accelerates and explodes, pushes out particles. They all, I mean, every all these propulsion systems, it's all Newton's second law. Whatever reaction makes it equal and opposite reaction. Something has to push this way to get this thing to push this way, right? I mean, they're, it's, they're, it's, it's always something else is getting pushed out. All right. Um, Hall effect thrusters. Hall effect thrusters traps electrons in an intense radiomagnetic field with a current, and the electrons then are ionized and create a hot plasma. The plasma is accelerated action. Like, I don't think we're going to do this. I just don't think this is ours. I don't think this is for us. Okay. Hall effect thrusters. Okay. And they're having trouble miniaturizing them. Um, radio frequency thrusters, what they do, um, develop for CubeSat and has been tested. Uh, a ceramic plasma liner is wrapped in an RF coil. Magnetic field is generated. Xenon and ion. So they're all the same, right? Basically, you're using some energy to ionize particles, and then the positive ions go flying out the back, and you go very fast. Because, and the reason why these things are so popular is because these things fly out at like 6,500 kilometers, and I mean, it's like just super an hour super fast 
Okay, propellantless systems. Systems that do not carry propellant for thrust are ideal candidates for small spacecraft. Such systems avoid complexity and reduce mass and can achieve high accelerations that potentially propel an object for interstellar, interstellar plant, plant, uh, interplanetary. And so this would include like a, a solar sail. Solar sails are the most popular method. Okay, but this is only if you have to move the thing. All right, and I, I think most CubeSats don't need a propellant system at all. Okay, guidance, navigation, and control. Is everyone holding on? Yeah. You know, this is long mm -hmm. and tedious. This is long and tedious. Yeah. But remember, we're just familiarizing ourselves. <clears throat> just remember, this is process. Okay. Um, okay, guidance, navigation, control. Guidance, navigation, and control. GNC subsystem includes components uh, for attitude, determination, and control. Okay, attitude, determination, and control. In Earth orbit, onboard position determination can be used by GPS. Alternately, um, ground-based radar tracking systems can be used. If onboard knowledge is required, then um, oh, let's not worry about that. Let's go here. Um, attitude control can use um, star trackers, sun sensors, horizon sensors, may not, may not magnetometers and gyros. Actuators are designed to change the spacecraft's attitude. Common spacecraft actuators include magnet torques, reaction wheels, and thrusters. So Austin was talking about this a little bit. Can't we use a gyro to make sure the alignment is correct? But then the reaction wheel starts spinning and is actually what corrects it. But sometimes what the reaction wheel will do is once it gets a spin, once it, once it corrects it, it sometimes won't totally stop it. It'll adjust it, but then something needs to stop the inertia. So it'll start to move, but might not stop. So that's something that needs to be looked into. I hope I'm not confusing people and making it more difficult. Well, I think maybe you could use the uh, gyroscope even as the reaction wheel, perhaps. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. You know, maybe. Um, You'll see some pictures here that, I've, that I, I got, and it'll give you kind of a sense. The reaction wheels are kind of big, really. They're th kind of thick because they're supposed to give inertia. So, um, yeah, it's something that we need to look into because this, this could be indispensable. It just depends on what our mission is. It could be if we did a biological mission, it might not matter. Up and down, left and right might not matter at all, right? So that it really depends on that. Okay, so guidance and nav control systems, you know, you can, you can, okay, reaction wheels, magnet torquers that actually use the Earth's magnetic field, star trackers are really, really accurate because there are stars out there that, you know, don't move against the night sky really at all. Um, sun sensors, Earth sensors, and um, the Earth sensors actually are temperature sensors between the North the, the, the cold poles they actually see oh this is really cold and this is really cold so those are probably the poles um gyroscopes um and gps okay so here's a here's a picture of a reaction wheel okay miniaturized reaction wheels provide small spacecraft with precision pointing capability reaction wheels can provide arbitrary torques um momentum and um with the exception of three units, all of the reaction wheels have, okay, I'm sorry, that's, I read that wrong. Um, oh, here it is. For, this is what I wanted to see. For full three axis control, a spacecraft re requires three wheels, right? So you need, if you're, if you're, if you need full three axis control, you need three wheels, okay? But you might not need it. You might just, you might just need an up and down. You might not need a left or right. Does everyone know what I mean? Right? If you just need an up and down, like this is the bottom and it needs to point at the earth, you might get away with one reaction wheel. Okay, so which is that's something we need to look into, or maybe two. Um, due to parasitic external torques, reaction wheels need to be periodically desaturated using an actuator for external torque, such as a thruster or magnet torquer. So um, I know that sounds complicated, but basically what they're saying is 
you might have to pair the reaction wheel with a magnet torquer, which is part, the most common is a magnet torquer, to kind of finalize the adjustment, right? So that it, it doesn't kind of reset it. Does that make sense? I'm not explaining this very well. If you're not getting a lot of this, don't worry about it. Okay. So the, um, the reaction wheel is like you're spinning a little bit, the reaction wheel reorients you, but then you you maybe have like a residual spin or something that's coming on and a little thrust then will stop it from the magnet torquer or from a thruster. Okay, so here's a whole bunch of reaction wheels. You can see that this is a mature technology. There's a whole bunch of them. They're all TRL-9. They've all been used in space. And um, and, they're, and kids love them. Kids love, kids love these things. But don't use this one because it's a kilogram. And that's basically, you're done right there. Your whole spacecraft is a reaction wheel, okay? We could do that, but I don't think we'll learn anything. Okay, magnet torquers are established technology used to small spacecraft to provide controlled torques perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? So if you've got like your little residual spin, um, it will slow you down because you've got that magnetic field up there, okay? little thrusters here. Thrusters are used for attitude control. Um, and then you have star trackers. Really, you know, look, I, let me skip star trackers and, and, um, and let me skip, okay, magnetometers measure the local magnetic field, provide institutes on your attitude and position. I kind of want to skip, so here's a whole bunch of magnetometers and you can see this is another very highly established technology. Um, sun sensors, you know, if you, if you need to know where the sun is, then a sun sensor is a possibility. Horizon sensors, also called earth sensors, basically um, find that juncture between the earth and space. Maybe they're temperature sensors. I don't know. Oh, poles, like I, I mentioned that before. Anyway, gyros. But I wanted to... Um, yeah, I wanted to jump. Well, let's do gyros here. Gyros provide measurement of angular velocity. The main gyro types uses small spacecraft. Um, okay, uh, so anyway, here's a bunch of gyros. But what, anyway, what I wanted to skip to was this here, was GPS receivers are the primary method. Because it's so much easier. Because think about this. Low Earth orbit is between 200 kilometers and 2,000 kilometers. So let's say low Earth orbit is 1,000 kilometers, but it's probably less. It's probably more going to be two to 300 kilometers, right? But geostationary is 35,000 kilometers. 35,568 kilometers, something like that, right? You know, and, and so the GPS is so far out there that you can use you can use GPS on your cube satellite just like you can use it here on the Earth. All right, with with you know minimal problems, right? So let's take a look at this. For Leo, GPS receivers are now the primary method for performing orbit determination, replacing ground-based tracking methods. Onboard GPS receivers are now considered a mature technology for small spacecraft. And there are um, actually cheap off-the-shelf GPS solutions. Okay, um, GPS accuracy is limited. Is limited. It's not going to be perfect, but it's still. I mean, we use GPS all the time. You're basically just using all the satellites into your stationary orbit, just like you do with your cell phone, right? So this is why you can have a cell phone thing and just use the GPS on the cell phone to get a basic bearing on where your satellite is. Everyone understand this? So it would be accurate enough to know which direction to point the antenna. Yeah, it would, the GPS would be accurate enough. I mean, the, the GPS satellites are tweaked for people on the Earth, right? So there's probably going to be some variance. It's probably going to be off by some part of a percentage. Um, but the reason why it's the, the number one method now is probably just because it's by far the simplest. 
um, just to use the, the GPS systems that are already there and you just just like you do on your cell phone. Um, yeah. Everyone dig it? Everyone digging? You digging? Okay, everyone's digging. Everyone's digging. You don't know if people are digging because they're all on mute, right? You just gotta assume they're digging, you know? I'm digging this, okay? Anyway, so this makes it easy. This is the easy way. Everybody, we like easy, right? I like easy. You like easy. Okay. Okay, so GPS receivers, all of them TRL-9. They've been used successfully in space um, for the duration of missions, you know, plus Skyfox. It's a really great name. I used to play that game. It was on Nintendo. So Skyfox Lab. There you go. Um, in deep space. Okay, so deep space. All right. So if for some reason one of you had some brilliant idea that required a CubeSat to go to the moon or something where it needed deep space, then you have to use a deep space network, which apparently is out there somewhere. And this is the nav control for any deep space mission. You're going past low Earth orbit. And this is like the only one. Okay, structure. Do we need structure in life? Yeah, everyone, people love structure in life. They think they don't, but they do. Okay, structure mechanisms and materials. <clears throat> there are several companies that provide structures, also called frames and chassis. Most are machined from 7075 aluminum. You guys are familiar with that. And we talked about that on, on one of the earlier lectures. So it was like kind of required, I think, by Cal Poly, JPL Cal Poly, right? Or no, it was Stanford Cal Poly, that, that whole thing. The section will highlight several approaches taking that. So you can oh, look at this. A 1U structure. Look, oh, isn't that attractive? I love that. It's a 1U chassis. You can buy it from AAC Clyde. Um, you're, oh, EnduroSat. They make a 1U1. One, you know, got 1U1s. You know, look at the mass. 0.1 kilograms, that leaves you 9. I love that. TRL 9. You know. Oh, look at, oh. Look at this. Look at this. Complex systems and small satellites. They have basically a Lego version where you like Michaela. She's falling asleep. Did you see that? She was falling asleep. Come on, Michaela. Look at this. This is exciting. It's like a Lego cube satellite. You can sight slow roast, first roast. No one's falling asleep. They're, look, they're all muted and on black because they're all falling asleep. Don't let them fall asleep, Christian. Okay. Okay. You just slide the cards in there and you're done. How You can't beat that. Look at how easy that is. You just slide your cards in there. Is everyone awake? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thermal mm -hmm. control. Yeah. So I could stop now and we could code if everyone's bored to death. I can finish this later. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Okay. Thermal. Let's, let's go. Let's go a little bit more. Does anybody here have the energy to code today? No. I'll, yeah. I'll keep going then. Do right, you want me to keep going? Go for sure. it. Well, I have two lectures to get through with you, so keep going. I guess. Okay, thermal. Okay. Thermal. Who wants to talk about thermal? I do. Okay, most spacecraft components have a range of allowable temperatures that must be met for optimal function will survive in the following high minimum grade. Okay, because, you know, it's hot and cold up there. It's hot and cold. No one's here. Glad to see that. Passive systems. Passive thermal requires no power for thermal control. This is used by using several methods. Okay, here's a cool method. Thermal isolated structure are joined together using multiple washels with low thermal conductivity. So basically when you're in space, there's two ways you can get rid of heat or get heat. One is you radiate heat to space. The other is you're touching something else that's either hot or cold. But because you're a CubeSat, you're only touching your own parts. 
So you can use washers with low conductivity to make sure that the computer parts don't heat up when the chassis hits up. Does everybody understand that? So your chassis is aluminum. It's getting hit by the sun. It suddenly gets very, very, very hot. But you have multiple washers of low conductivity that are separating out your computer system so that the heat isn't transferred to your computer system. You all dig that? But just a lot of other a lot of other stuff they do here is thermal coating, which is just like basically paint, sunshade, louvers, let some of the heat out. I'm gonna go fast. Um, thermal insulation and coating. The properties are almost entirely surface properties. You're basically talking about right here, paints, polish, and plates to keep the things cool. Maybe reflective stuff. Oh, look right here, paint. You got paint right here. AZ technology makes paint. Okay. Sierra Lobo makes sun shields. Basically, they're like reflectors. Okay. Louvers, if you want the thing to open up and let, let some heat out. All right. Passive heat pipes. They, they have liquid in them and, and the liquid expands and contracts and absorbs some of the heat that way. Yeah, so those are pretty cool technologies there. Uh, okay. Next subject data handling, command and data handling. Command and data handling, okay? Um, some of the cheap parts have successfully flown in LEO over short mission durations of less than one year. Oh, that's a, that's a warning sign. So let's, let's look at some of these parts from that. Um, Smartphone-based processors. Okay, so here's a picture. Here's a chart. And you can see on, integrated onboard computing systems, okay? So smartphones like CubeSats, so NASA actually put a phone in space. Other people have too. But here's where we are, right? Open source platforms. A number of open source hardware platforms have promised for small spacecrafts. The Arduino consists of a microcontroller and circuits called Shields. You're, okay. And then over here at the bottom, Raspberry Pi is another high performance open source hardware platform capable of handling images and high-speed communications okay so this is where we're at we decided to start with arduino and um and raspberry pi and i, I put a couple pictures here arduino has become known as beginner friendly making use of microcontrollers and offer for software design raspberry pi has full featured embeddings linux system or raspbian this broadens the range of tools and allows people to use Python. Not only does this ease the learning curve for new developers, but allows full power of the Linux system. Okay, so this is our strategy. Our strategy is to go Arduino or, and Pi, or both, or both, okay? You can see this one on the left is an Arduino sat. Here's the chassis, here's the, the antenna, but this whole thing right here is an Arduino. Okay, now the flight control computer here, maybe that is a Raspberry Pi, or maybe it's something that we buy, all right? UHF transceiver, but this whole thing right here is the Arduino. Now, so this is called, I think they usually call this like an ARD sat. This is called a Pi sat, because this is a satellite made of Raspberry Pi. You have a Raspberry Pi motherboard. You can see like some of this technology you're used to, right? That's just a flash card right there, all right? So this is a Pi sat, this is an ARD sat. Okay, everybody with me? Okay. Okay, great. All right. Um, here's some other open source uh, flight control stuff that we could look at sometime, but not now. Okay. You guys already know Linux is on your Raspberry Pis. Okay, communications. Communication subsystem. We know what this is, how to communicate um, to the Earth. And here's all the frequencies. Um, here are deployable antennas, which are a little risky because you need a burn wire to function correctly. But here's a patch antenna. It's what we call a patch antenna, which is just patched on the side. Oh, well, we don't want to use a patch antenna because it means less solar panels. Solar panels. Right. Well, okay. So, you know, it's a little give and take there. Maybe put the patch antenna on one side, but then that's tricky because you might need some gyroscopes to make sure that patch antenna is facing the earth, right? So you got a little bit of give and take on that one, okay? 
Um, but if you buy an established system, you know, it's a little bit safer. Okay. Um, here's software defined radio, the onboard radio tuner. Here's an antenna that's deployable. You get into space and the thing just goes, just so it flies out of the, that. All right. Developers of antennas. So the UHF VHS antennas, which is used by the amateurs, including us, you can see they're all TRL nines almost. So they've been used in space. Um, okay. Ground data systems. Okay, so ground data systems, you have spacecraft operations, payload operations, and mission controls. But for small spacecraft, there's no distinction. It's just mission control. Ground station networks have been improved, and there are some companies that will do it for you. So you can hire some of these companies. You know, we're making our own ground station, um, but you can actually hire some of these companies just to get the data for you. And so here's a company called KSAT, which is low cost and they have antennas all over the earth and they just pull data for you and uh, what's the one that we used to use or deal with that one company that's like for free going out of greece or like um never mind but there's another there's some people i know that do it for free um ground data system hardware and software you can see like we use g predict because g predict you can get it to the place where it actually wrote, you get autonomous tracking, right? We don't want to put the money into it until we get a good antenna, but our plan is once we get a good antenna, um, we can get a rotator to follow it, follow it across the sky. All right, but there's other ways. There are other types of ground systems. Okay, and this is, this is, this is us so far. You can see we got some clouds over here. We got some clouds over here. I don't know, man, if we looked hard enough, we might be able to see Hawaii, but I'm not sure if, if it's even we're gonna get a picture of Hawaii. But we're getting, we're getting there. Hopefully this guy from Boeing will help us. Maybe we need to put some more time and money into it, but we're starting to get images at least. Okay, this was Hannah and Austin with a laptop, the dipole. I think this was also the same dipole. I think there were like three other people there as well. Just... Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Probably. Uh, and that's it. Okay, everyone, you did good. Thanks for staying awake. Mostly. Oh, Mr. Herman, can I talk about our, a possible mission statement that I just had came up with?